Hare Krishna. What is the Bhagavad Gita perspective on the reversal of the Roe v. Wade case by SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of America, which has now deprived women of the right to abortion? Answer, I'll first talk about it, what has happened from the legal perspective, then we will talk about the ethical, sociological, financial and spiritual dimensions of the issue. So basically since 1973, the Supreme Court in America had through a judgment, in a case which was called Roe v. Wade, decided that everybody in America has a right to abortion. Now, the decision which was made in the Dobbs case recently was that there is no constitutionally ordained right to abortion. The court cannot make laws. It is the legislative assemblies, the Senate and other such bodies that make laws. So the court said that the previous decision was wrong and this hasn't changed the legal status of abortion immediately. What has happened is every state will now be able to decide or will have the responsibility to decide. So there are states which are more right-wing. They may bring more and more restrictions on abortion and there are more which are left-wing, which may remove all restrictions on abortion. Some states have already proclaimed their intention to become abortion sanctuaries. So this is what has happened. And there has been a sustained, prolonged conflict between the pro-life and the pro-choice movement. And at this point, one key insight from the Bhagavad Gita, which, we, which is, could be vital, is the concept of not reducing people to their positions. This Krishna calls in the Gita as knowledge in the mode of ignorance. So the way it is currently portrayed in the polarized world that we live in is that the left portrays that if anybody who opposes abortion, they hate women and they hate women's rights. And the right it portrays that anybody who supports abortion, they hate babies. They want to kill babies. And the reality is often much more complex. The 63 million abortions have happened uh, since 1973 after Roe made it legal. So just to give context, 63 million is actually more than the number of deaths due to direct war in the Second World War. That is estimated to be 50 to 60 million. So it's huge. Now, is it that six, there are so many people who hate babies, so many women specifically who get abortion and who hate babies? It's too simplistic to reduce the position of pro, uh, pro-choice to hating, hating babies. And pro-life, it is not that they hate women. To phrase this issue as a woman's right issue is itself a ploy, which makes anyone who opposes it as anti-women. But let's look at it from a slightly broader perspective. Unfortunately, as, temp as tempers have been rising over this issue, there is extremism coming up from both sides. Some pro-life activists in the past have attacked abortion clinics and have been attacked and uh, wounded some, on some occasions fatally abortion performing medical service providers. And on the other hand, those who are pro-choice, they have also attacked some pro-life clinics, some activists. Uh, there were aggressive demonstrations outside the houses of conservative Supreme Court judges. There was even an assassination attempt 
made towards one of the judges. So temperatures are rising. And to the extent we demonize the other party, any kind of sane level-headed discussion or uh, tangible resolution is going to be difficult. So let's look at it first from the ethical perspective of the issue. So abortion is sometimes portrayed simply as in India when the law was passed uh, supporting it was called as medical termination of pregnancy. It was called MTP. And it was portrayed as a measure for population control. Often it is the embryo is portrayed as if it's just a tissue which is to be removed. And there has been systematic attempts to deny the reality and the gravity of abortion by the pro-abortion lobby. There is a movie made on Pure Flix, Unplanned, which tells the conversion story of Abby Johnson, who was an abortion activist, who headed a clinic in Bryan, Texas, and who facilitated over 22,000 abortions. And despite doing some, so many, she herself had no idea of what actually happens in, in abortion. It is only when there is a staff shortage that she was asked to fill in. And that time she actually saw how the fetus is just like a miniature human being with arms, hands, legs, and how it is systematically mutilated and decapitated. And you know, it's, 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 it's killing. So the ethical dimensions of the issue are obscured by trying to prevent people from knowing the reality and the gravity. Somebody, there is an the argument that the fetus is not actually a person. Well, from a scientific perspective, the potentiality for a human being is non-different. Biologically speaking, the embryo has all the potentiality for a human being. And there is no decisive biological marker, which is non-arbitrary, which can say, at this point, the embryo becomes a human being. And at this point, it doesn't. <coughs> Uh, if, if we can, some arbitrary marker can be made, but there are atheist philosophers like Peter Singer and others who said that a woman should have the right even to abort after the baby is born. And then his and similar other uh, atheist philosophers or materialist philosophers' propositions uh, led to a furor. They said, don't be sentimental. From a scientific perspective, the location of the embryo makes no difference in its status. So if while the embryo is in the belly of is in the womb, <coughs> the embryo can be aborted, then from a scientific perspective, there's no difference in aborting outside. So if you want to go down that slippery slope, where will we stop? Can a five-year-old child be aborted by parents if they want to? So the more as far as the moral worth and the moral status of the embryo is concerned, you know, most people intuitively understand that it's a baby. Consider the situation where a uh, mother wants to, a uh, uh, mother or a parents want to have a baby. And then from the earliest sonograph, where the baby might be nothing more than just a shapeless lump of flesh. It is much more than that, but to the vision that we can see in sonography. Even when there is that, at that time also, the, the parents try to discern, oh, this is the head coming out, this is the arms coming out. And they feel such joy and affection and pride. So is the ontological status of the embryo dependent on whether we want it or not? That means if we want it, oh, it's my baby. If I don't want it, it's just a lump of flesh that I'm going to remove from my body. No. So it is just by passing a law this way or that way, the issue is not going to be resolved. But at the very least, there has to be uh, unfiltered or unsuppressed transmission of information about what actually happens in abortion. Uh, so fetal personhood can't be denied because it's, whether, whether it is the fetus, the embryo, the infant, the youth, the adult, they are all stages of the same person. 
Now, having said this, uh, then the question comes, why has human, so human society come to a place where so many women want to abort their child? Unless we look at it from the sociological dimension, issues cannot be resolved just by legislation alone. Why are so many women not wanting to have children that they want to go for abortion? This idea of unwanted children is also mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita where the word used is Varana Sankara. And it is seen as a valid social concern. However, the solution over there is not to abort the child, but rather to reorganize society in a way that is according to virtuous principles so that the circumstance of unwanted children doesn't come up. Now, what has happened in today's world when it is when this is made into a solely women's rights issue, then it also becomes a women's responsibility issue. And if we want to consider who benefits from abortion, why is there such a strong push to defend abortion? Let's look at who benefits. The, the, when it's phrased as women's rights issue, it's women who benefit. Now, how do they benefit? That in most cases, pregnancy doesn't pose any serious health hazard to the women. There are exceptions, of course. But in most cases, it's not a health hazard. So calling it as a reproductive health issue is a generally a misrepresentation. Yes, it is an issue which has many dimensions. Uh, woman, if she has a child, she may... It may affect her career, it may affect uh, her looks for some time, it may create some financial challenges. If the father is not, is the mother and father are not married, then having a child means having a relationship with that particular person, even if they, they didn't want to have a relationship. Or at the very least, it means carrying the child to term and then giving the child for adoption. So these are disruptions, these are inconveniences but they are not directly health issues. So the, the phrasing of it as a reproductive health issue is extrapolation from rare exceptional situations. So when I said that it is phrased as a woman's rights issue, it also is made into a woman's responsibility issue. What does that mean? In the past, say before abortion became widely legalized across the world, uh, if a man and a woman united, say it was outside the context of marriage, and if a woman became pregnant, the man would have to take responsibility. And there were something called shotgun weddings where the woman's father would go with a gun and uh, tell the man to marry. Now, that's certainly not the best way to get married. That's certainly not the best way to get pregnant. But the point is, abortion now makes gives men free license to indulge in their baser impulses without having to take any responsibility. So a woman is told if she becomes pregnant, you know, why were you not on birth control? Why are you not taking the pill? Uh, it's your problem. Now you take, take, take care. You get rid of it. So it's an unfairly heavy burden to pray, place on the conscience of a woman to, that she has to take the responsibility for ending the life that is growing inside her. And one way that unfairly heavy burden is dulled is by making the women believe that there is no life over there. It's just some tissue. So men's irresponsible instincts are also pandered to, catered to through abortion. Beyond that, who benefits? The whole abortion industry benefits. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And um, there is huge amount of money. And that is why during the pandemic, when the the whole world was shut down when even many important medical services were shut down in most parts of the world. Abortion was deemed an essential service and continued on. So it's huge money. And so those who are making money through this industry, they benefit from it. And beyond that, even the government benefits from it. 
how is that the government doesn't have to create arrangements for uh, for child care for accessible and affordable health care for the children that are going to grow up so abortion is a way to evade responsibility and mint money for a lot of people so it's and certainly a woman is directly affected when she becomes pregnant but it is a issue of humanity and its perpetuation so its reproduction is not a individual issue because one individual doesn't reproduce it needs two to reproduce so phrasing it as a women's rights issue makes it actually reduces the complexity of the dimensions of the debate so <clears throat> this when it is made into a women's rights issue as it what happens it, it rights brings a lot of emotional baggage everybody wants liberty freedom rights but there is there are other dimensions to the issue to be considered so from a sociological perspective it is true today that unwanted children could mean that children having children has become quite expensive even within marriage what to speak of when it happens outside marriage or before marriage and what there are of course exceptions when it may happen because of sexual assault and other things but the point is that society has become structured in such a way that having children is expensive and motherhood is often seen as a burden that even parenthood in general may be seen as a burden and so this is where we need to consider the spiritual perspective here by spiritual i mean what is the meaning and purpose of life what is it that truly nourishes our spirit when we believe that or we are made to believe by a materialistic world view that the purpose of life is just pleasure then what happens is krishna talks about this in the 16th chapter 11 to 15th verses that kamo bhoga parama etavati nishchita anyayena that when we start believing sensual material pleasure or sensual pleasure is the driving purpose of life then the result of that is that anything that comes in the way of that sensual pleasure can be removed so krishna talks about how such people who are sensuous can even become avaricious they can become greedy they can become mercenary they can even become murderers so that is unfortunately the trajectory of society has followed where sensual pleasure sex, the sexual revolution made sexual freedom as a as a inviolable right of everyone and therefore the consequence of sex, sex which is uh, having children that is seen as a inconvenience as a burden to be dispensed with so abortion brings technology into the service of humanity or humanity's baser desires to separate indulgence from consequence or sensuality from the attendant responsibility and that's why there is this vehement insistence on abortion just 10 years ago former american presidents even obama and clinton they said abortion should be safe legal and rare but now what has happened is abortion is absolute moral good new york times declares or share your story shout your story that's that those are trends on facebook where women are told to come out and tell their abortion stories that there's nothing to be ashamed of in it be proud of the fact that you had the courage to do abortion so what has happened over here is that there's a slippery slope where by by legalizing and making abortion more and more easy that any checks on it have been removed and now there is a sense of not just the uh, the abortion allowing abortion as a as a necessary adjustment for emergencies where a woman is assaulted or a woman's life is in danger now abortion is portrayed as if it is a inviolable right and not only right is it is it is something good so 
unless we consider something to be good why would you want to share share your story of how you had the abortion so this is the slippery slope yes what is legal when something which is which is involving killing is made legal and readily accessible this is the slippery slope we go down so so what is the solution a spiritual world view recognizes that human life we find fulfillment not by sensual indulgence but by service by taking responsibility for caring for others for improving the quality of life of others for raising others consciousness and thereby uh, in therein raising our own consciousness and parenting is a way in which humanity takes responsibility for other human beings and thereby one grows and so unfortunately in the uh, today to the extent sex has become glamorized after the sexual revolution it is something which we all have a right to do and we can do it any time uh, who is there to stop it but the ironically with the glamorization of the sex of sex has come its trivialization that it's glamorized it's it's it fantasized about and then it's casually indulged in where you know people have a few drinks and then in the back of a car or in some room somewhere you know as uh, john lennon said that most of the western world is uh, conceived has been conceived in the back of a car after uh, after several drinks he was exaggerating but it's not complete exaggeration it's tragic so we need to we need to recognize the sanctity and gravity of sex in the bhagavad gita dharma viruddho bhitesh bhuteshu kamotsmi bharatarsha bakrishna says that actually uh, sex provides human beings an opportunity to become co-creators with god in bringing new life into this world and it is not because of puritanical um or moralizing culture that sex is considered to be a private and sanctified activity that was gen- traditionally uh, done or at least uh, recommended and uh, enjoined to be done within the sancti- sanctified bond of marriage why because it is grave we are bringing new life into the world and the way humans society human human race is structured is that human beings when they are when they are young newborn they need a lot of care and for one person to offer that care is difficult that's why there is pair bonding and a man and a woman come together when they have a child then that strengthens the bond between them so not only we need to recognize the sanctity and gravity of uh, a sex itself but also the importance of marriage and the importance of parenting that results from marriage we humans have a deep need to nurture and when we don't take care of that need to nurture when that need to nurture is not taken care of through the natural arrangement of parenting what happens is that unfortunately people replace it with something else and um, in america in several major cities new york la san francisco in the caucasian population the white population basically the the number of pets has become more than the number of children uh, what has happened is that we have deglamorized parenthood especially motherhood oh it's just an inconvenience the burden in the past when a mother would not when a woman would not be able to conceive a child that is considered a sad thing there's no need to stigmatize the mother that was unfortunate but it's it's sad but now the idea is i am a child free not a childless woman i'm a child free woman well motherhood is a privilege it's a special gift so abortion basically uh, uses technology to to deprive women of the speciality that nature has given them you may say oh it's not a speciality it's a burden because women have to become pregnant well yes every gift comes with some liabilities and it is society that needs to be structured 
in a way that that is not seen as a liability but is seen as a gift so to the extent we can have a spiritual ethos in the sense that we understand that life is meant for service life is meant for evolution life is meant for growing by caring for something beyond ourselves uh, to that extent we will start seeing parenting and mother, motherhood parenthood and motherhood not as burdens so just by passing a law it is good that at least abortion is not been seen as a as a legal right because when something like killing is made legal it will become very easily accessible and it will be done nonchalantly so there have to be restraints on that but the legal route alone is not the solution that if simply the solution is seen to be banning abortion well those who need those who are in a situation for whatever reason that they want to abort they want to abort they will either have to go to some illegal clinics where the their health might be endangered or they may try to do it in their alone on their own in their in their bathrooms and that would be even more dangerous so the solution can we, the moral cannot be enforced simply by the legal moral changes cannot be made simply by legal changes but legal changes can make the immoral very easy and that has that plug has been stopped to some extent and that sense this move is welcome but there can, there need not be any triumphalist a tone on the side of the pro life or an alarmist tone on the side of the pro choice now this is a serious issue and there are substantial changes socially not just individually required and that requires a raising of our consciousness a reexamination of what brings meaning and purpose to our life and when we can restore the gravity and sanctity of sex the sanctity of marriage and the glory of parenting and mothering then we will be able to address the the causes that make so many people want to consider abortion as an option thank you very much hare krishna